Welcome to the Mentor Podcast, where the most highly motivated entrepreneurs come to get their weekly dose of financial stability with host Ron Legrand, as well as other nationally recognized thought leaders who will teach you how to get, grow, and protect your wealth. Well, hello, everybody. This is Ron Legrand, and we're on another episode of the Mentor Podcast. And today, we are literally coming to you virtually, which is something I rarely do. I have with me uh, uh, Al Nicolotti, who is an attorney, and his specialty is probate. He and I met in his office here one day not too long ago at the urgence of of my sister, BJ. So I thought it'd be a good idea to get him on here today and let him tell you everything he knows about probate in 30 minutes. Now, will it take that long? Uh, Hey, Ron, the more we talk about it, it's going to feel like two hours. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Why don't you give them a little bit about what you do in your background, and then I'm going to just turn it over to you and rudely interrupt as I see fit. Sure. I appreciate that, Ron. And my name is Al Nicoletti. I'm an attorney here in Jacksonville, Florida. I do probate all over the state of Florida. And Ron, yes, we met back in, I don't even know if it was February or March, but I'm so happy you have me on here. A little bit about me. Um, A lot of my practice involves a lot of probate, uh, probate litigation. Uh, real estate litigation, like quiet titles, partitions, uh, and various other trust administration matters. So we really come in when it is a unique uh, title issue that is not for a title company to solve, but you you get the Allen wrench out of the toolbox and you really need us to help figure that situation out. So we also can do some of the foreclosure defense litigation, depending on what is involved. But overall, one of my biggest areas that I've realized uh, about my practice is probate, because investors, realtors, other real estate professionals come across this stuff, not just when they're doing their lead sources, Ron, but when they're doing their natural mailings and their natural tax delinquent targets or foreclosure, they come across these leads naturally. And so- a lot of what I've done in the past has led to this. And probate is just fascinating because we are heading to one of the most populated times of the baby boomers. And many of those people back in the 70s and 80s invested in real estate. They didn't think about the IRA or the Roth or the traditional or the investing in the stock market, but they bought all the land, they bought all the homes and they rented them out. So the baby boomers are carrying a load of property and what better place to have that than Florida. Yeah. All right. Well, first of all, we got listeners on here from all over the country. So if they were to get a hold of you, you have uh, links with other attorneys throughout the country who specialize in probate and quiet title or whatever. Yes. If anybody had something from, let's say, Arizona or Mm -hmm. uh, California or Georgia, Mm -hmm. Um, I have developed a network of reaching out with attorneys that they focus their practice there and they do probate there. So it's a great referral system. And anybody that ever had a question, I'm I'm able to help them. All right. Let's start by you explaining what quiet title is. So quieting the title is, in essence, filing a lawsuit to rid of any judgment liens, any recorded liens, not mortgages because title insurance underwriters don't view that as coming off in a quiet title, except the tax deed. But what a quiet title is, is your file, we, we as lawyers are filing a lawsuit to quiet and any and all interest that may prevent a title insurance policy for the buyer at the end of the day. So it's kind of like a foreclosure. Except you're just notifying everybody that your title search says you would ha- have any interest in the property and telling them to come forward and explain their interest now or forever hold their peace, correct? Correct. Like the one I had in February, there was five recorded judgment liens certified. So it was like Geico, it was Visa, MasterCard, and they all had a certified judgment recorded against the property over mm-hmm. various periods of time, clouding the title. So they right. couldn't sell the real estate without it being wiped off or paid. So they, they had a choice of coming forward and foreclosing or doing nothing. Or trying to collect their money, trying to enforce their right yeah. in the court to say, hey, we are owed 8000 plus interest over nine years. Okay. So let's say they came forward 
And uh, what, what, I mean, what, what would happen in this quiet title suit if one of those creditors came forward? Just like what we would do probably in a probate situation, we would say, look, let's look at the judgment because it has to be certified by the clerk. We had that in the quiet title. There was a judgment. It was just entered by the judge, but it, there wasn't a certified copy recorded in the county records. So it didn't solidify their position as a creditor, as a, as a lien holder. So one of the things I would do is look at that. And if that didn't work and they had all their P's and Q's together, we would look at them like a probate creditor that it is entitled to be paid and say, look, are you okay with 4,000 or 2,000? Because okay. otherwise the property's not going to get sold and you're not going to get anything. Okay. So you, um, so you do have to uh, negotiate them if they come forward. Or litigate them and say, you don't have a right because of this, this, and this. Okay. Yeah. But quiet title is also used to clean up any title issues other than creditors and uh, miss, I, mean, I don't know, missing signatures or whatever is on the title that needs cleaned up. So it cleans all that up, but you say it does not precede a mortgage. Right. And one of the resources, except for a tax deed in Florida. So the tax deed process, a whole other conversation, mm -hmm. but the clerk and the county is charged with notifying the past lien holders like mortgages and, and certified liens and serving them by mail. And if they were served properly and somebody buys a property at a tax deed sale and there was a mortgage, yes, that comes off. If they weren't notified, right, and that happens sometimes, then no. And it, it, it all matters when you go to the title insurance underwriter and you ask them, will this mortgage come off? So if you just picked up a quick claim deed, Ron, and there was a mortgage outstanding from some lender and you said, whoa, I didn't know that. I just picked up the quick claim and you want to try to quiet the title. Well, I'll mm -hmm. say, let's do it all day, but it's not up to me. It's always up to whether that buyer's insurance company will allow it. All right. Um, you mentioned uh, tax deed sales. Um, is it still true? You always got to file a quiet title if you buy a property at a tax deed sale, but you probably won't get clear title when you're trying to sell it. Not necessarily. So after four years from the purchase of the Florida tax deed, then you would bring that tax deed to the title insurance underwriter title company and then get a title commitment because the statute under the state of Florida says if you've held it for four years, it's insurable. Not just marketable, but insurable. Then I got to hold it for four years. <laughs> okay. Well, you could. Suppose I want to sell it. Well, if you want to sell it, then yes. After you buy it and six months later, you go, Al, I want to flip this. I think I can make a great deal off of it. Yes, you would come retain me. We'd file the quiet title tax deed. And then we would always get a title commitment from the title insurance company to make sure when you close, it mirrors right. everything. Okay. Uh, well, in this case, you would already own it. You bought it at a tax deed sale. Now you just clear up title, which I, I did myself a little while ago. So. Let's get into probate. One of my favorite topics, Ron. <laughs> Your specialty, okay. My specialty. So, tell, tell me, what is probate and when does it occur and how does that affect real estate buyers? So what is probate is not the complicated process a lot of people have heard about. When you're thinking probate, you're thinking transfer of title from what somebody owned real estate. They own real estate on their name. They die. And in order to get it to the heirs so that the heirs can either hold it and keep it, or they want to sell it to a buyer, mm -hmm. there's that process where they the heirs hire a lawyer. They, they file this court case in the court system that transfers title upon a judge saying, title moves over. Now it gets recorded. That order gets recorded. And that order is in the county records for the title company. So that's all that is. Moving it to the true heirs, whoever they may be. So, you know, you know how many times we run across uh, kids, parents die, kids think they own the house, but they don't own anything until it goes through probate. Now, uh, you're in Florida now, so um, I heard you say that liens have to be certified. It's not necessarily the case in other states. But by the way, can you handle any case in Florida? 
Any probate, yeah. Any case in Florida, probate, quiet title, yes. Okay. So you have to file a uh, probate, and then you have to notify any of the heirs that you can find or anybody that uh, that seems like they have an interest in this property, kind of like a quiet title, or who do you have to notify? So it's a little bit simpler than just notifying everybody. What you want to do is let's just say it's one house. It's in Jacksonville. You find, you, you do your mailers, you find one of the heirs. The best thing you can do is ask them, who was it that owned the real estate? Okay. Were they survived by a spouse? Is there a will? Who were the children? They're going to eventually tell you who the whole story is. Mm-hmm. But that's the best way to get everything up front is finding out who are all the children. Because in Florida, If it's homestead property, title vests means it goes automatically to those heirs before probate, but then definitely during probate. Homestead is very unique in Florida, but you still need the probate process to formally transfer it over. So the kids don't own anything until the probate process is over. Yes, on paper, yes. About how long would it take to go through probate, assuming nobody comes forward and wants to bitch? Um, So let's just say uh, pre-COVID, I was knocking out probates in Duval County in two to four days. Um, Ron, I'll surprise you. (laughs) How do you do that? You have to serve everybody. You don't have to serve everybody in the probate. So notify them? Well, if you have all of the heirs... Mm -hmm. And let's just say date of death is more than two years. The creditor period is over. So unless there's some kind of mortgage where you want to do a subject to and notify that mortgage company, they're going to get Mm -hmm. paid off at closing when you go to the title company. Which, by the way, we should point out that heirs have the right to take over that debt without the bank calling the loan due, don't they? In the case of it passes through to a family member. Heirs don't have any obligation to that debt that that decedent had. I know, but in, when that title transfers, they can't call a loan due. I remember that's part of Garn St. Germain, if it's an interfamily transfer. Well, the exceptions to the due on sale clause. Okay, good. Okay, there we go. The Ron Legrand information right there. Yeah, as worthless as it may be. <laughs> okay. But, but here's well, the thing, Ron. These probates don't take forever. You know, you've heard probate take six to eight yeah. months. When you have the right steps and the right info, I have just made this such a niche for myself that Mm -hmm. I asked so many questions up front. For example, date of death was two months ago. Okay, you're starting to ask, is it just the house? And are there any creditors mailing? And if they've done a really diligent search and there's nobody else, there's nobody that's going to make a claim like a Vista, a MasterCard, a Home Depot, then if they're, they can swear to it that there's no debtors. And we get this done as quick as possible. Now, COVID has slowed some stuff down, but you better believe as soon as I get a case number, the orders are being sent straight to the judge. Yeah, they're still working. They're just not probably in a building. So I'm going to get this clear now. Last parent died two months ago. I want clear ownership. All I got to do is see if I can find everybody that might have an interest in the house, which means they have a lien on it. I mean, not on it, but they have a debt. Don't have to be a debt on the house, does it? Like your Visa cards, right? Well, I don't know if I classify it as a debt, but they have a vested interest as a potential title holder in the property. But they don't have to be lien holders attached to the property. They don't have. So, not, so what you're really looking for in probate are just the heirs. So you find that house, mom died two months ago, and you find the son. And you approach son and say, hey, I'd love to, love to buy your property. He goes, I've been looking for you, Ron, my whole life. And then he says, let's go under contract. And you go under contract, you bring it to the title, and they say, well, whoa, mom died on the property. You need to do a probate. So then you're looking at the seller going, well, did mom have a surviving spouse or was there a will? And he goes, no, no, nothing. Well, do you have any siblings? And he goes, yes, we have three siblings. Well, if it's the primary residence of the property, in order for a closing to occur, you're going to need one, two, three, and four for the real estate contract. 
because at the title closing, they're going to want deeds from all four. Sure. Okay. But I was talking about other debts the parents may own, may have. Like, That's the creditors. Okay. That's what I said. They don't, they don't have a right to homestead property, but if they are mailing the house and they're sending the bills and saying, dear John Smith estate, you know, you're, you are owed, we're owed a thousand dollars. We have to know about those bills going to the house because mm-hmm. we notify that creditor in the probate, we give them 30 days from a formal notice date of filing. And if they don't respond, they're out. Okay. So when you say two to four days, you're assuming nobody responds. We're assuming that either um, date- I, yeah. There are none, really. There are none. None right? that you know of. Okay. None that the heirs know of, or date of death is more than two years. All right. Now, this is homestead. Correct. What about non-homestead? So non-homestead plays a different role. If non-homestead, if date of death is more than two years, underwriters generally allow it to go just as fast by just getting some of the orders we need in the court. So again, date of death, more than two years, two to four days. If we have everybody on board, everyone's got to be on board. Okay. But if less than two years, you're starting to look at the value of the estate and what type of probate we open. And generally, that is when we have to do that dreaded newspaper thing where nobody reads the newspaper anymore, right. but we still <laughs> put it out there, right? Yeah. yeah, one of them stupid rules. <laughs> right, right. Are you obligated as an attorney to notify everybody or not? We are obligated to notify the people that the heirs have done a diligent search and finding. And we always ask them and we say, look, who are the heirs? We make sure this is everybody. And we always say you have to perform a diligent search for known or ascertainable creditors. And they've they've done that and there's nobody. That's all we do. Okay. Now, in a regular normal case, and nobody is trying to sue anybody. What time frame are you really looking at? Nobody is so uncontested. Yeah. No creditors? Mm, yeah, there's got to be some creditors. Most people have somebody they owe. Okay. So let's just say a Visa or MasterCard bill comes in. All right. Okay. And let's just say we file the probate. Mm-hmm. We serve Visa MasterCard. We technically, from the formal notice, we wait 20 days once they are served. And after 20 days, if they don't come forward, we then present all of that evidence to the judge and he reviews it. And if nobody's come forward, they generally sign it. Okay. So once the judge signs it, title is transferred to the heir. That's it. It's over. And it's clear title. That's it. That's all, that's all you need for the probate, Ron. So right. that's why due diligence before you start scrambling in a probate and getting a title commitment from the title insurance company is very important because while it'll be clear on the probate end, you want to make sure there's no superior liens, inferior liens. Yeah. Okay. So now siblings want to fight. One of them sue the other, which you know better than anybody is what happens a lot of the time. You know, parents don't think my kids ain't going to fight over my stuff. What a joke, huh? <laughs> It is. They're going to fight like hell when the parents are gone. So uh, now you can't do anything except sit around and wait until that lawsuit is uh, cleared up, can you? That's right. And so that's one of the big things that we're heading to in 2030, 2040 is the amount of debt the young ones have and then the amount of money that their parents have. And they're all going to be fighting over the money. So you kind of see that that's a possibility with probate litigation. We have a case right now where the guy had a will. Um, I guess that the attorney that drafted it, drafted it in such a way that tried to leave a life estate to the, to the girlfriend and it, and it had nine beneficiaries. Well, they all didn't like the girlfriend. Nobody get along the, they didn't like who the PRs were. So we kind of jumped in halfway and we were putting all the papers aside going, well, what's going on here? And when we realized all we had to do was start getting hearings and start filing our motions and getting judge the judge to enter the orders or to send us to mediation, 
things got moving. So one of the things in probate is you don't just let the file sit. And that's the difference with what I'm able to bring is we don't let it sit. We move it along. Even if it does take two to three years on a heavy litigious probate case, the idea is it's moving along to final resolution, which in this case we did. We got a mediation order and everybody's getting something and they're all walking away unhappy, but sometimes that's the best result. Yeah. And fighting the rest of their life. Right. (laughs) Okay. All right. Listen. I know you get letters from real estate investors after probate is filed to buy their particular house. At what point can the house be sold? I mean, it has to go through probate, doesn't it? So that the kids can deed it? So the idea, well, let me talk about the letters. Actually, I don't get as many as you think, Ron. And maybe that's a good thing because... A lot of the times, the person that you should be reaching out to are the heirs, is the Mm -hmm. personal representative. If there is one, you don't always have to have one in the probates, but when there is one, then you reach out to them. So, Well, wait a minute. How do I know who they are until after the probate is filed? You would see it on the filings when you open the court file. You'd see. So you get that file and then you send them a letter. And it better be a gently worded letter. Okay. And you don't need to make it war and peace. You don't need to make it super long. You don't have to make it. You just say, you know. So you could say, I just want you to know that uh, once your probate is over, I buy houses. And if you can't afford to file probate, I'll pay for it, which is a trick I've done several times. (laughs) I pay for it after I get a quick claim deed from them and I'm holding it in my hand. And then I, I get it cleared up, and then I want another deed from them just for safety's sake. But a lot of people just can't pay the cost to go through probate. We'll get there about what we could do differently where all we need up front are costs, and the investor can pay that for the heirs, and we just wait until the closing to get paid. But as an investor, Ron, if you find the Florida pre-probate market is incredible. I mean, you're thinking of once the probate's done, I'll buy the house. What you miss is how many people have never taken care of it because they don't have the right resources or understanding of how they can get the money without paying anything. So if you find that one heir, it's just one, she was the daughter, and there was mom that died, you technically can be under contract with her. And if that's the homestead, mm-hmm. all you need is her. If there were two kids, you need both. And uh-huh. then you bring it to title. And then you say, hey, look, we got to do a probate here. We know somebody that does probate. And then they say, okay, great. You say, look, all you need to do is pay the, the cost up front. And if you can't, the investor can. And you, all, he could wait until the end for the attorney's fees, whether it's uh, 2000 or 2500 But they wait until the end. There's nothing up front about it. Well, that's that's good to know, but that's, of course, in your case. But like you just said, like I just said, I get the quick claim deed because I can't get a warranty deed. They can't warrant the title yet. They don't have it. And then after, and I make it clear to them, once we get clear title, I'll give you whatever money I might owe you, but not until we get clear title and I'll cover all the fees. Uh, I don't know, it's worked pretty well for me. So you're saying the best time to send a probate letter is right after it's filed, but send it to the potential heirs, not to you, because there's nothing you can do about it. Is that correct? That's one. Mm -hmm. Or you you find a way to go after the tax delinquents or whatever else there is, and there could be a situation where there would need to be a probate, and a lot of people don't know how big that market is in itself. Yeah, that's right. A lot of people die and they owe taxes and the kids don't know what to do about it and they can't afford to pay the taxes and they don't own the house. They can't borrow against it. Right. Yeah, that makes good sense. All right. So um, your normal cost is somewhere between two and $3,500 to do a probate. I don't know how long it takes, you know, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, because there's costs and then there's fees. So if it's just the homestead and there's nobody else, there's no other creditors, just the house, it's the cost to start it is 250. If there ends up being multiple properties, it could range to 650. 
And then we can wait until the end. And that's where it can, our attorney's fees can range 2,000, 2,500, 3,500. It all depends. Yeah. Yes, of course. Now, of course, you said you'll take it out of the closing, but that doesn't mean there's a closing. Okay. A lot of people go through probate without selling their house. All right. So what do you think the, um, the uh, biggest mistake people make or what's the biggest misconception they have about probate? I think the length of time. I think the length of time and finding the right people to help work the file. See, Ron, I'm not a title company. So I'm not mixing and matching all the title stuff too, which takes time on its own. I'm more of a niche so I can focus on what we got to move over, get it filed. So a lot of the timing is off. Um, I just have a unique work ethic, I guess. Um, And I would say that getting that title commitment and getting title run is something a lot of the investors or realtors, it, it, it just goes over their head because they're so excited about the deal and they're so excited about the uh, seller heir that wants to sell, but they also have to realize what about the mortgages? What about the liens? What about the back taxes? What is there now? It went from, you know, a high equity to tight equity. And are you really making any money out of the deal? Yeah. All right. So um, how does one reach you? So one reaches me by my phone you answer. You're going to get phone calls. Just want you to know that. Hey, that's great. Because I'm in Florida, Ron. I can do Miami, Naples, Pensacola, uh, Jacksonville, of course, uh, Mm. anywhere in Florida, probate, the trust administration. So the best way to reach me is 904-246-9994. And check out my YouTube channel at Al Nicoletti. And I have a whole slew of videos that I post out every Friday that talks about all this informational stuff on probates. It could be on certain types of title stuff like deeds, whatever it is. I post every Friday. There's going to be new videos. So subscribe, like me there. And you can find me on Facebook at Al Nicoletti and add me on there as well. Al Nicoletti. Nicoletti. N-I-C-O-L-E. T-T-I. Okay. And do that phone number once more, please. 904-246-9994. Okay. And again, if they're out of state, you can guide them to someone they should contact where they live. Yes. Feel free. If you have a probate somewhere, it's a great connection for me too, because then I can start reaching out to some lawyers that may have issues in Florida as well. So you never know the long-term prospect of it, but we know people in California, Arizona, Georgia, uh, South Carolina, just have at it. All right. And pretty much anywhere else? Uh, Yeah, I I would say Virginia. I know somebody there. I think we can find some people in Tennessee, Uh, but it, you play it by ear. Um, if it's Montana, or maybe I'll work on that. Or it's Idaho, <laughs> I'll work on that too. All right. Well, is there any last minute word you want with our folks before we get off of this? I just tell everybody, look, probate in Florida is, is the coolest thing you can do in real estate. It's a fantastic niche if you find the right people and get the right tools in place. And it's something that has enlightened me doing real estate because I did not start just in real estate. It was in foreclosure first and then probate like hard second. So mm-hmm. just know that this is a, a really unique niche and it is interesting and never boring in my world. Okay. Well, let me first point out that it's easy to get a list of people that have been that after the file probate. In fact, uh, yellowletterlady.com can do that for you. And now it's just a matter of crafting a letter. And um, I tell you, I see a lot of people sending our yellow letter to the owner of the property who's deceased. And that irritates the children. So I would uh, send the letter to the children and make sure that they know, you know, the parent is deceased. And very Don't need a long letter. Just let them know if you're interested in selling the house. I want you to know I'm here. And um, if you uh, are not equipped to send it through probate, I'll be happy to handle those expenses for you as well. That's and and they'll keep that letter. And when you know the timing is right and their grief subsides somewhat, you very well may be the one that they'll call. 
Um, but I can tell you from experience, when you send a letter to the deceased person, which you know is deceased, that upsets people <laughs> pretty heavily. <clears throat> All right. Right. Absolutely. Uh, and I would hit them with at least two or three hits as well during this probate process because you always want to be top. Of so, um, all right. Did we miss anything? If I, if I were to ask you, what did we miss? What would you say? I mean, I think we covered a bunch of stuff in the probate world yeah. and you know what? I do seminars and webinars on this stuff, Ron. And every time there's a tweak, there's something else, whether it's a power of attorney issue or it's yeah. a reverse mortgage question, there's never uh, enough questions or enough topics to talk about. But these yeah. are the basics. Al, do you do real estate closings? I do not. You do not? Okay. I do not. That's why I focus on this niche. All right. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate you taking time to spend with us today. Thank you, Ron. You are you working out of your office now or your home? Uh, I'm home right now, so I can come and it's quiet for the webinar. But yeah. uh, we've been in the office really just me and the managing partner every day since it started. Uh, the secretaries went home, uh, yeah. but I I've been working. I've been busy. Real estate is hot right now. Yeah, it is. I love it. You know, everybody I talk to says they're more productive if they're not in the office, <laughs> including us. <laughs> But geez, it gets boring sitting around the house all day. I got, I got to get out. I don't know. But <laughs> our big excursion now is going to the grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> make it, make uh, it. Yeah. All right. Anyway, it'll pass. Well, thank you, sir, for taking the time with us today. I appreciate you. Thank you, Ron. I really appreciate you having me on, and it's all been, right. it's been great talking to you. My pleasure. That's all for this edition of the Mentor Podcast. To connect with Ron and learn how you can attain financial freedom, as well as up-to-date strategies to grow and protect your wealth based on today's discussion, go to www.connectwiththementor.com.